All right, I want to talk to you today about Calvinism, my beliefs on Calvinism. And if you see the title of the video, you see I'm not a Calvinist. I am predestinated to not be a Calvinist, okay? And it's not because I'm ignorant. It's not because I just judged the thing before I heard it. Um, I've looked at both sides. I've looked at the arguments of Calvinism, and they just don't line up with the Bible. And I'm going to show you in the study today that that is a fact. Now, I could do a very, very in-depth study and talk about the history of John Calvin and who John Calvin is and the, all the five points, the T-U-L-I-P, total depravity, um, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perse perseverance of the saints or preservation of the saints, whatever you want to make that, the, the fifth one there. I could do that, but the fact of the matter is, um, you know, the Bible talks about building upon another man's foundation, and Paul was basically saying, if I see some other brothers taking care of something already, why am I going to go and try to do the same thing? And what I'm saying, the reason I'm saying that is because there are some excellent works that have already come out debunking the thing of Calvinism. So if you want to get into all the nitty gritty, all the little fine details and points and everything else of Calvinism, then I would like to recommend two books for you because it does, it does, it's a good idea sometimes, brethren, to get off the internet and actually look at some paper books, you know, especially a certain paper book, you know, very important. First, you have this one here. Let me zoom in. Why I Am Not a Calvinist by Peter Ruckman. And I know people get all upset about Peter Ruckman. You know, they say, oh, he's a heretic and he's a this and he's that. Have you actually listened to the guy? You know, I mean, you can cut people's sermons up and, and make them say all kinds of wacky things. People do it to me all the time here on YouTube. And I mean, you know, Ruckman's been out there for over 50 years in ministry. You mean to tell me you can be in ministry for over 50 years and never make a slip up or, or say something that you shouldn't have said or whatever else? Come on now. You wouldn't, you know, you'd cry foul if they, they put that standard on you, that you had to be perfectly infallible for 50 years. I don't think so. Here's the other one. The Other Side of Calvinism. You can see this one here. This is like the definitive work on the thing of debunking Calvinism. It's by Lawrence M. Vance. And uh, over 600 pages long. I mean, this thing is like the textbook of debunking Calvinism. Okay. And I have, I've read this one, the Ruckman one. This one I've read uh, parts of it. I haven't gotten through the whole thing simply because I've studied Calvinism. And I just kind of bought that thing from my library. And there's so many other things to, to research and read and things like that. So, um, but it's an excellent source of reference material and things. Now, if you talk to a Calvinist, their favorite passage that they will take you to is located in, in, chap, or in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. So we're actually going to look at this passage of Scripture. We're not going to just read verse 4. We're going to read the, the verses surrounding it, both before and after and I'm going to show you that their system of God, if, in case you don't know, if you, if you are new to this issue, um, God, according to Calvin, John Calvin, he was a 16th century um, scholar, if you will, according to that system, God has pre-chosen all those people that get saved. And so God looks down from heaven and he says, okay, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. And in fact, he did that before he even created the world. So before you were even born, God already knew whether you are going to be saved or lost. Right? That is Calvinism if you want to boil it down to the very simplest form of it. And of course you get into hyper-Calvinism where you start to go, they overemphasize certain points and they get really, really nutty to the point where you don't have to witness to people because after all, God's going to choose certain people for salvation, whether you like it or not. Whether, you know, he's going to be forcing these people to get saved against their will oftentimes. I mean, it's just hyper-Calvinism gets real bad, you know. But even Calvinism, even the very basic tenets of Calvinism, does not line up with the King James Bible. I'm going to show you that today. So go in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And while you're turning there, you know, I just want to say this as a the very first tip-off to you. Being a Christian should be just the name Calvinist. Are you a Calvinist? Uh, we're taught in the Bible not to follow men. Why would you name yourself after 
or name your movement, your beliefs after a man. You know, Lutheran, Menno, Knight, you know, Wesleyan, Methodist, all this stuff. That's a problem. That back there in 1 Corinthians, Paul actually rebuked the Corinthians because they were saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. And Paul's like, who are we? We're just ministers. Don't name yourself after me. You know, name yourself after Jesus Christ if you want to. Call yourself a Christian. But don't name yourself after a sinful man here on the earth. So that should be the first tip off to you if you're a Bible believer. But let's actually look at the passage here. We're going to see how the Calvinists teach it and why it doesn't work. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. If you get up to heaven, are you going to walk in there and just be like, I'm here, my... You know, your holiness, I'm my holiness here is here. Everybody's going to be so impressed. No, that's not going to how it's not going to be how it works. The reason you make it into heaven, the reason you have anything at all waiting for you in heaven is because of your relationship to Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ, you are a new creature. All right. If you are in Christ, then you have spiritual blessings and spiritual rewards that are coming. But it's only because you're in Christ. So what's the, what's the you know, passage here? What are we already seeing? We are seeing it's about Jesus Christ. It's not about the people. It's not about you, you, know, you being some ultra holy person. No, you're only holy because of what Jesus Christ did for you. It's going to be important as we continue. Let's look at verse 4 through 6 now. According as he hath chosen us in him, in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Okay? We need to observe a few points here. Okay, first of all, you say, well, Brian, right there you see it. He's chosen us, you know, in Christ. We've been chosen before the foundation of the world. We're these special saints. And so it doesn't matter what we did. We've been chosen by God. We were created by God to be saved, to be Christians. Um, wouldn't that lead to pride? You see, when I talk about myself and I say, you know, I'm saved and I'm on my, my way to heaven, you know why that is? It's not because God chose me before, way back when, before the foundation of the world. No, you know why I'm saved? Because I came to the Lord as a broken sinner of my own free will. You know, when I heard the gospel, when it was preached, when I heard it and it was presented to me, I came to the Lord as a broken sinner and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And I put my faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why I'm saved. So what, I am, what am I in the world? I'm just another sinner. That's all I am. It is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, of whom I am chief. And we can all look at the skeletons in our closets in the, of our past lost life, and we can say, I'm, I'm quite a sinner. If you're saved, you can admit to being a sinner. See? But you see, if I was a pre-chosen, pre-elected individual, well, maybe I'm not such a bad sinner after all. It was a, you know, just kind of a some mistakes I made in my past, but after all, I was chosen from the day I was born. Before I was even created, I was chosen of God. That's not what the Scripture is saying there. And let me just say this. Who was present before the foundation of the world? You say, the body of Christ. <laughs> oh, well, in a way of, in a manner of speaking, the body of Christ was there, but it was Jesus Christ as God the Father. The Bible says about he was before all things, and by him all things consist. So Jesus Christ was there before the foundation of the world. And he knew that he was going to create man, and I believe the Lord knew man's going to fall, and I'm going to redeem man. And I want to create man. Why would God create man if, there, if he had never had any intention of bringing man to heaven to live with him? Why would he do a thing like that? Of course the Lord knew that. But how is he going to bring man to
to heaven by forcing man up there? Is that how the Lord would want to do it? Or by giving man a free choice and saying, you have the will to accept or reject? I'm going to show you that that's the biblical way. Point number two about these verses here. Why would God knowingly create the majority of people understanding that they are going to go to hell because they're non-elect? Why would God do that? And we're going to see later, we're going to go over some scriptures that, that talk about God not will, being willing that any should perish. Well, if that's true, then why? how does that work out? Because see, in Calvinism, it teaches that God chose certain people as the elect and other people, they're not elect. So there's absolutely nothing that they can do to get saved. Which adds up to a really weird system because you get somebody and they get up there to heaven, they get before God and God says, depart from me into everlasting fire, you know, prepared for the devil and his angels. And they say, what was I supposed to do? I would have gotten saved. You know, I would have liked to have gotten saved, but I couldn't. You know, even if I had wanted to, or, or maybe they'd even say, even if I'd wanted to get saved, I couldn't have done it because I'm a non-elect. And God said, yeah, yeah, you know, I created you, be a non-elect and go to hell and stuff like that. Huh? Doesn't work. Here's another question for you. What about babies? That's a problem for Calvinists. Because, see, only the elect go to heaven, right? So what do you do when you have a baby that dies? You have to teach, as a Calvinist, that all babies that die are elect of God. God chose all babies that die. They go to heaven when they die, don't they? You say, can you prove it? Sure. Romans chapter 5. Turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, verse 12 and 13. If you want a proof text for babies going to heaven when they die, here it is. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So a baby that's born is a sinner. Even if they've done nothing wrong, they're still a sinner. Why? Because they come from Adam. They can trace their genealogy back to Adam. Verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but look at this, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. What does imputed mean? Imputed means put on your account, okay? Um, if you have a criminal record, it's not going to wind up with your neighbor, going over to your next door neighbor. It's going to be put on you, okay? And so what the Lord is saying here is sin is not imputed when there is no law, all right? You say, why would there be no law? Well, a little baby doesn't understand. I'm sinning against God. They can't understand the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, excuse me. They can't understand that. So God cannot impute sin to that child. All right? And there's a lot of debate back and forth. You know, what is this age of accountability? Is it 10 years old? Is it a little bit younger than that? Or, you know, I think it, it basically depends on the child themselves. Because there are some children that mature earlier than other children and whatever. When a child can come to an understanding, I am sinning against God here. Not that I'm just disobeying my parents, but I'm actually sinning against the God of the universe. And they can understand the Ten Commandments. They have now reached the age of accountability. Okay? But when they're a baby, God can't impute sin to them because they don't understand that they're doing wrong. They are sinners, but that sin is not imputed to them until they understand the law. That's how the thing works. So then if you're a Calvinist, you have to believe that every baby that dies is a chosen elect of God. It's kind of weird. But let's keep reading here. Romans chapter 5, verse 14 through 21, because we're going to see something else, which is very interesting. Romans chapter 5, verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Adam is a figure of him that was to come. We're going to see later that Adam is the first Adam, and then there's a second Adam, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 15, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, Adam, 
much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by that one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, Adam again, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. I love how Paul clarifies it there so that you don't get confused. When he's talking about salvation, he's talking about Jesus Christ. When he's talking about you being a sinner and born into sin, he's talking about Adam. Verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Again, we have Adam. Even so, by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ there, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Another good argument there, you know, that uh, they say there are many paths to God. Not according to the scripture right there. The obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Verse 20. Moreover, the law entered, that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So there you can see this thing of you are born as a sinner because you have, you are Adam's seed. You are part of his one of his descendants if you go back far enough. So you are born into sin, so you can't be redeemed by that sinful flesh. Right? You cannot be redeemed by Adam. doesn't matter how good you are, how nice a person you are, how well-meaning you are. You can never be good enough to get to heaven. Your only chance is the second Adam. Okay? The one that came and paid for your sins on the cross. You say, who's that? The Lord Jesus Christ. Keep this in mind. Turn next to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and go to verse 20. Okay, it says here, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, remember, Adam, by man came also the resurrection of the dead, Jesus. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Get that. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. All right, so... You see it, you know, the, of course, the picture there of the resurrection. You have, the, you know, the Old Testament saints coming up when Jesus rose from the dead. Many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose and, you know, were coming into Jerusalem and everything else. You know, there Matthew chapter 28, I believe it is. And so you have that first part of the resurrection. Then you have the rapture when the body of Christ is removed. And then you have, you know, a um, resurrection there towards the end of the, you know, time of Jacob's trouble. And you know, the possible you know, thing there you know, towards the end of the millennial kingdom as well. Um, but you, know, you see that there. But the thing that we need to see from this passage is the fact that there are two Adams here mentioned. The first Adam puts you into the category of being a sinner, like it or not. The second one redeems from sin. And you're going to see why all this makes sense here in a minute. Go next to verses 45 through 49 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay, it says here, And so it is written, The first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Look over in Ephesians chapter 2, I think it is, it talks about, you know, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So you get saved, you know, the Holy Spirit moves in. Interesting there that uh, Jesus Christ, the last Adam, is called a quickening spirit. Spirit. Hmm. The Holy Spirit. But let's continue. Verse 46. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. Oh boy. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the Heavenly. Um, big problem for Calvinism. All right. Keep your hand right there and go flip right over to Ephesians chapter 1, where we started out. Ephesians chapter 1, 
Verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Would that be before Adam was born? Adam was created? Yes. Before the foundation of the world, that'd be before Adam, wouldn't it? Wait a second. If we're chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, then why does it say over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 46, Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. See, Calvinism has to teach that you're in Christ, okay, before the foundation of the world, Adam's created, Adam sins, you fall out of Christ, and then when you're born, when you're created, you're brought, brought back into Christ as a saved elect individual. Uh, no, that doesn't work. Why? Verse 46, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 46, Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is physical or natural. What comes first? You're born as a sinner. You're not pre-chosen from before the foundation of the world. That's a lie. What was pre-chosen there, the predestination thing, what's chosen there is Jesus Christ and the inheritance that comes from being saved by Him. That's what's there before the foundation of the world. You being connected to God through a personal relationship with His Son is what's going to get you the spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Your destination, when you get saved, your destination is fixed. Predestinated. Okay? That's what's going on there, brethren. It's not, I have been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, and then Adam came, was created, and he was born in sin, so therefore I'm born in sin. But that's okay because now somehow, you know, you're in Christ, you fall out of Christ, and you fall back into Christ. That doesn't work. See, the whole system of Calvinism is based on a lie. But let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Let's keep reading here. Because it gets even worse for the system of Calvinism. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. It says here, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. You know, before the foundation of the world, his good pleasure. What is his pleasure? Back in Revelation chapter 4, I think it is, it talks about, and for thy sake, you know, they are and were created. Or no, excuse me, and for thy pleasure, they are and were created. Why did God create us in the beginning? Just to, you know, whatever. Oops, I, I created some people down there. Uh, well, I guess I'll just let it go. Is that why? No. God created us in His image. Making, making man in His image. Why? For His pleasure. He wants to have a personal relationship with us. He wants us to know Him as our Heavenly Father. That's why. Verse 10 that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Look at this little reference to the pre-tribulation rapture. Both which are in heaven, the dead in Christ there, and which are on earth, even in him. The dead saints that are in heaven. So, sorry to the old soul sleep thing there. Both which are in heaven and those that are on the earth. See? Dead saints living in heaven with Jesus Christ right now and living saints on the earth. You say, why are they need to be gathered to the Lord if they're already in heaven? That doesn't make any sense. Their soul is in heaven. Their spirit's in heaven. Their body's on the earth. You go find the grave site of D.L. Moody. You go there, dig it up, you'd find his skeleton. He's some saint that dies recently. You go to the funeral, there's their body laying there. You see? The resurrection there, at the resurrection, at the rapture, the body becomes, it changes becomes incorruptible. That's why I don't believe in, you know, what's going to be left behind at the rapture. I don't believe it's going to be a bunch of dead bodies, Christians uh, laying around like that. They're not going to find us. I need to do a pre-trib rapture moment on what's going to be left behind there, but so I'm not going to talk about it right now. But uh, anyhow, let's get back to the passage. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. 
Okay, what's the predestination? Well, I got saved back when I was 25 years old, and I immediately went to heaven when I got saved. You say, no, you didn't, Brian. You're right here talking to me. You know, I'm 39 years old now. You know, I've been on the earth 14 years after my salvation. I didn't go right to heaven. We'll say, then, then you're not going to go to heaven ever. No, I'm, I'm going to go to heaven. You see, I'm predestinated to get there, but i got to make a couple stops along the way. Do you ever fly someplace? You know, last time I was on an airplane, and it will be the last time because of the TSA nonsense here in America, insane, ridiculous Nazism that it is. Last time I went someplace was I flew to Alaska. And I went, I flew out of, uh, I think it was Philadelphia or Baltimore. I can't remember which now. It was quite a few years ago. But um, I went from, we'll say Philadelphia, and I went right to Alaska. No, we went and we stopped in Chicago. And then we went up to Alaska. See, my destination was Alaska, but we had to stop in Chicago first. See? Now, as a Christian, you get saved, your destination is fixed. It's heaven. You're going to be up there. All right? But you have to make a couple stops along the way. If you'd have told me back when I got saved I'm going to be living in, in northeastern Maine someday, I'd have looked, been like, what are you talking about? Here I am. The Lord has a purpose in me being here. The Lord has a purpose in you being where you're at. And maybe He'll have you move eventually. If you are truly in line with the Bible and you're doing the will of the Lord and seeking the will of the Lord and, and sanctified as a Christian, you're down here for missions. And God might actually say, I'm going to send you such and such a place or I'm going to have you talk to that person or run into this person at the gas station or over here at the grocery store or whatever. God has you here for a purpose. He's committed unto you the ministry of reconciliation, according to the Bible. So God's going to send you places and have you do His work. But that doesn't change your destination. Your destination is fixed. You are predestinated to get to heaven and to obtain that inheritance which is in Christ, which He purposed in Himself before the foundation of the world. You know? I mean, it's, you know, the Lord's up there in heaven and he, and he creates all this beauty of heaven and everything else. Paul talks about it when he sees it. He says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. This beautiful, amazing place. Just blow your mind like it did to Paul when he went up there. Absolutely amazing. And the Lord says, I created all this. I'm going to create people and I'm just going to let them down there and die. I'm just going to turn into soil again. Eh, you know. No, no, no. When he decided to create man, he made a way. He said, I'm going to make a way for those creatures of mine, that creation. I'm going to make a way for them to come and live with me forever. But only those who choose to accept me out of an act of their own free will. God doesn't look, you know, what's, what's God wanting in heaven? A bunch of robots and stuff? He could create that. God could create people to just be mindless slaves to him and just, I'll do whatever you want. I just, uh... But that's not the God that we serve. The God that we serve makes each of us unique and interesting in our own way. And that's what the Lord wants. The Lord, you look down through the centuries of who God chose to be saved, you know? And when I say chose, I'm talking about, you know, they come to Him in, in the right state and they say, okay, Lord, I'm a sinner. Not just, you know... I'll pray a prayer at the end of it, the evangelistic service because of the emotion and whatever else. And then I go back to living just like the lost world and, and end up being an atheist later on in life or something. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody that's actually coming to the Lord in repentance and saying, I can't make it to heaven. Okay, please, I need to accept you you know, by faith and, and that. Okay, that's what I'm saying. And you get those people... And you look at some of the people that have been saved down through the centuries, the Lord's chosen some really unique people to be saved. You know, okay, I mean, some very, very unique people have gotten saved. It's going to be an interesting time in heaven. Looking forward to it. But uh, let me show you the next verse. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12. And again, we see the predestination there in verse 11. Now look at verse 12. That we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Was that God's forced 
conversion of you because you're a chosen elect, or is that your own free will? If you first trusted in Christ, that's your own action. That's your own free will. That's not you being forced by God. Irresistible grace, you know. I mean, God just forces you against your will, just, you know, grabs you and, you know, by the back of the hair and slams your face into the table and says, Get saved now! You know, it's your time to be saved. You're a chosen elect of mine. You're going to be saved now. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm a Christian now. Is that how God would do it? Of course not. That's ridiculous. Don't be absurd. You have to come to a place where you realize you need to be saved. Come to the end of your own self-righteousness, you know. Turn from your self-righteousness there. Turn to the righteousness which is in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. See? Trusted, you know? After you heard, you know, there, the gospel. Heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Those are all things that you do of your own free will, brethren. After that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. You see how the whole thing works out? The whole system of Calvinism is just ridiculous and falls flat on its face when you actually read the context of the thing. What's going on there before the foundation of the world? The Lord says, okay, I'm going to create man and I'm going to create him so he can come to live with me someday and have an inheritance. All right? That's the eternal purpose there. And man has a right to re receive or reject the Lord. And when God chooses you for salvation, when I say that, God chooses you for, for salvation, it's because you've come to him. And you put your faith in him and you say, God, please save me. The Lord's not up there going, oh, I'll check back with you in about a week or two, see how things work out. You know, you come to the Lord in that, in that broken state and where you just say, I am not, I'm not good enough to get to heaven. Repentance, okay? Repenting, turning from your self-righteousness, turning from thinking that you're good enough to get there, turning from thinking that you're a good person, understanding that you're a sinner. That's the gospel I've always preached, brethren. And, and there are people who say, I teach work salvation and all this nonsense. You know, whatever. Absolutely ridiculous. But let's continue. Now I want to look at some verses that disprove the thing of Calvinism. And these verses actually prove that man has a free will. Let's go to John chapter 3, verse 16. John 3.16, the infamous, a lot of people know this verse, probably one of the most memorized verses in the entire Bible. John 3.16-21 through 21, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever of the elect believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For, Oh, wait a second there, I read that wrong. Uh, for that uh, whosoever believeth in Him. Whosoever? You mean uh, saved and lost? Elect and non-elect? <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Verse 17, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Um, belief is something that you do yourself. It's up to you. I have $20.36 in my pocket. Do you believe me? You say, well, Brian, can I see your pocket? No. Do you believe me or don't you? Is that something I can force you to do? No. It's something that you're going to have to just say, well, okay, I believe you. I, I guess you're telling me the truth, whatever. See? And the Lord says, I can save you. Jesus Christ is the way. Do you believe that? That's not God forcing you to believe. That's you being given the option. You have the option now of saying, I believe by faith that Jesus' death on the cross is what's going to pay for my sins. Okay. Uh, verse 19. 
And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. They have free will. In other words, For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Free will. Absolute, total, complete free will. The lost... It's not that they don't come to the Lord because they don't understand and they can't possibly understand because they're not elect. That isn't it. Why aren't they coming to the Lord? Because their deeds are going to be reproved. You know? That's the whole thing. People don't want to come to Jesus Christ because they know it's going to mean a changed life. They understand. What's going to happen if I become a Christian? You know? I've met some tough old old farmers and loggers and stuff like that, and they don't want to get saved because they don't want to face their buddies down at the bar. Walk in there and say, I can't come in here anymore. What are you talking about, man? What are you, what, what is this, a joke or something? I got saved. I'm a Christian. You're a Christian? Oh, ha, 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 ha. That's why they don't want to get saved. And a lot of them, they understand that they're going to have to have a changed life. Don't give me this thing of, all the lost, they can't understand that they have to change their life. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. And that's not what the scripture says here. You know, everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Can the lost world understand that they're sinners? Absolutely. Absolutely. What did we read earlier about over there in Romans chapter 5? You know, sin is not imputed when there is no law. But guess what? When they get old enough, they understand that the law is there. The law is inside them, convicting them. The lost world has a conscience. And I realize they can kill their conscience after years and years and years of rejecting Jesus Christ and living in sin. But the fact of the matter is, they have a conscience. God put it in them. And this disgusting, easy believism salvation that comes along and says, don't talk to the lost people about their sin. Don't tell them that they're sinners. Don't tell them that they have to turn from sin when they get saved. Don't tell them any of that stuff. We'll just kind of spring it on them later on when we get them saved and we get them in our Babel building and then we start to tell them the standards of Christianity. It's ridiculous. Absolutely, completely ridiculous. And lost people know it too. A lot of these lost people, they understand what salvation is. And you try to come along. I saw this one guy, you know, this old farmer I knew. And, uh, you know, I saw this one of these easy believers and people tried to witness to him and stuff. He didn't get anywhere with it. It's not about sin. It's not about sin. Turning from sin and all that. So you don't have to do it. Just faith in Jesus Christ. And this old farmer's like, I don't want anything to do with it. You know why? He knew he was going to have to have a changed life. This guy telling him, oh, you don't have to change your life. You don't have to. Just believe. Just believe in Jesus Christ. Just believe to be saved. The old farmer knew better. The guy's lost on his way to hell and he knows better. Next, let's go to Matthew chapter 23. Here's another good one. And these are good ones to use, by the way, if you want to refute Calvinists. They start to pull off their little thing of elect, non-elect, and all this other stuff. Here's another good one to use. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Want to talk about free will? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Jesus Christ is saying to Jerusalem, he's saying, I want to save you. I want to be there for you, and you chose not to, of your own free will. He didn't say, how often would I have, cho how often would I have, uh, you know, Saved you, essentially, here is what he's talking about in the passage. How often would I have gathered you under my wings, and I, you couldn't because I forced you not to. That's not what Jesus Christ is saying. He's saying, I would have, but you don't want me. He came and he presented himself to those Jewish people, and he said, I'm here, I'm your Messiah. Do you want me? Accept or reject? What is it? And they said, reject. And not all of them, by the way. There's a lot that did get saved. And there will be those that get saved in the future. Romans chapter 11. But the point is, they had a free will. 
Next, let's go to Romans chapter 10. Another famous salvation passage, Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 13. We're going to see the thing of free will exercised again here. Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 13. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, which, that is, the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, it's a believe word again, uh, <clears throat> and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Doesn't sound like God forcing them to do that. It sounds like it's their own free will. Verse 11, for the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. You say, well, Brian, you see, that's referring to the elect. Whosoever the elect. Why would you even say that? that doesn't, that's not even logical. Whosoever of the elect, you know, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All the elect are going to be saved. I mean, if you want to make that, verse 13, Brian, that's about the elect. Those pre-chosen of God, the pre-chosen of God. That wouldn't even make sense. Because all the elect are naturally going to be saved because God chose them before the foundation of the world. No, what's going on here in verse 13 is God is showing that it's man's free will that determines where they go when they die. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Man has a free will. The system of Calvinism is ridiculous nonsense. And by the way, people say, well, then you're an Armenian? No, I don't follow man. Okay? Armenian is, Arminianism teaches that anybody can get saved as an act of your own free will, but then you have to keep yourself saved by your works. You know. And, of course, Calvinists, they say, well, we believe that God chooses you for salvation, but then you're preserved, you're predestinated until, you know, going up there. And it's like, well, that's kind of half true because, you know, if you're not a Calvinist and you get saved and things, they probably question your salvation. So it's still kind of a work system. Next, let's go to Acts chapter 17. Acts 17, verse 30 and 31. Another two good verses to kick Calvinism. Acts 17, verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere? Not just the elect? Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. You know the most wicked, most disgusting atheist out there still has a conscience that they have to kill? The wicked, most wicked, disgusting people out there, they still understand that Jesus Christ died for them? Deep down? Why? Because God put it there. He's given assurance unto all men. And He commands that all men everywhere repent. How can they repent if they don't have the law in them? The law is written in their heart. Their conscience bearing witness. Hmm. That's why they fight so hard against the King James Bible and against the name of Jesus Christ. That's why they fight it. That's why you go to a lost person, you say, you don't have to give up any sins, you can just be saved, you just believe this, you know, pray this prayer and whatever else. Lost people understand. They know better. They know what salvation is. Okay? But again, you see there, free will. Everybody has a chance to get saved. And it's by their own actions in terms of coming to the Lord. They aren't forced to come to the Lord, is what I'm saying. You get saved by what Jesus Christ did for you. Okay, I'm not saying it's good works or something like that. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, you coming to the Lord is by an act of your own free will. Not because God is forcing you in irresistible grace. You're like, you know, God's got this magnet like pulling you along and you're just like, no, 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 I don't want to get saved yet. You know, I'm, I'm the elect, but I'm not ready to be the elect yet, you know. <laughs> 
You know, when I was a kid, um, just tell you this real quick here. You can turn in your Bible a while to 2 Timothy chapter 2. When I was a kid, I was very, very rebellious. And going to a uh, church building too, by the way. And you know what I wished for? I mean, it shames me to say this, but uh, I wished that somebody could prove the Bible was a lie. I wanted to be an atheist. You know why? Because I was living in sin. From a very young age, I was addicted to pornography. And my conscience bore witness that it was wrong. It wasn't because of the Babel building that I was raised in. My conscience bore witness. I knew I was wrong. And I wanted so bad for somebody to just say, oh, God doesn't exist and stuff, because I can do whatever I want in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. God gave me that law in my mind. Let's continue. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes. Oh, great. They're saved people, right? Keep reading. That they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Huh? Paul is calling lost people elect? Mm hmm. The nation of Israel. That's what's going on there, you know. In context, that's what it's talking about. Lost people are called the elect. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Next, we're going to go to, turn the page here. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 through 26. Just jump down there in this chapter. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. So it's just not talking about just saved people in the passage here. Gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, like lost people do, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. You say, but Brian, it says up there, God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Yeah, God convicting their conscience, okay, and saying, I'll save you. Whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You want to get saved? Salvation's available. The blood was shed for you. You want salvation? It's right here. Come and take it. And you see, lost people are walking away from God, and they have to stop what they're doing, and they have to turn, repent. Instead of saying, I'm a good person, I can keep going this way, I can keep going my way. No, you stop, stop. Turn around and you walk towards the cross. God will give you, He'll grant you that repentance. He will say, okay, I see you've turned. I see you've turned from your own self-righteousness and turned towards me and now you're coming towards me and you're saying, I want that. And the Lord hands out that salvation and says, here it is, it's a free gift. You know, I mean, if I said, here, King James Bible, free gift. Just reach out and take it. You want it? You want to take it? Right there it is. Do you look and you say, well, he's forcing me to take that. Well, I guess it's mine then because I was forced to take it. No, you reach out and you take it. I'm going like this, like that. You reach your hand up and you say, thank you for the gift. Now it's yours. That's salvation. What the Lord's done for you, and he says, free gift, whosoever will. Who wants it? Does anybody want it? He ain't going to force it on you. The Lord's not going to say, you will get saved. I chose you before the foundation of the world. You are going to get saved whether you want it or not. It's weird. Weird system of belief that this John Calvin came up with. Next, let's go to John chapter 5, verse 24. John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and 
believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. There's those action words again, hearing the word and believing. You say, well, God forced him to do it. Come on. <laughs> no, he did not. You have an act of your own free will to get saved or reject. Next, go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. It says here, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all the elect men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Uh, oh, wait, I read that wrong again. <laughs> Silly me. Who will have all men to be saved. All men. Not just the pre-chosen elect before the foundation of the world. All men to be saved. All you got to do is take it. Next, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And there are so many scriptures we can go through too, by the way. I'm just giving you the good ones here, the ones that you can really pin a Calvinist with. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says here, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Hmm. I thought only the elect were saved. The, only the elect could go to heaven. Wrong. Romans chapter 11. Turn back to Romans chapter 11. I was just kind of going through and, and going through my Bible, and I was, these aren't really in order all that well. I usually try to do that. But uh, it doesn't hurt you to go back and forth and back and forth a little bit once in a while. Give you more of a workout. Romans chapter 11, verse 30 through 34 says, For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Verse 33, O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been His counselor? You know, that's what Calvinism really boils down to. This pride of saying that there's an elect, there's an elect and a non-elect. And God obviously would know who was saved before the foundation of the world, and therefore he's omniscient, he knows everything, and therefore he would know who's going to get saved, and so he creates people. That are, what are you trying to do? You're trying to figure out the mind of God. That's what you're trying to do. But look at verse 32. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Why would God have mercy upon people that are not elect? Seems kind of dumb, doesn't it? I mean, these Jewish people here in Romans chapter 11, what's, what it's talking about here, the, the election, you know, that God made that covenant, that Abrahamic covenant, and God looks down upon them and He has mercy for them. But they're in unbelief. And if they die in unbelief, they go to hell. Why would God have mercy for people that He created to be predestinated to hell? You see? You say, well, Brian, I'm just trying to figure this thing out about God and stuff. Quit. Stop trying to figure out God's mind. It isn't going to happen. Okay? Ye cannot be as gods, knowing good and evil. And, you you know, lowercase g gods, but you can certainly not be as God the Father, knowing good and evil. It isn't going to happen. Quit trying to figure out God's mind. 
Just read the Bible and say, hey, my Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let me tell you about salvation, friend. Let me tell you that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins. And if you are smart enough to turn from your own self-righteousness, thinking that you're good enough, that you aren't going to end up in hell for eternity, if you're smart enough to turn from that self-righteousness and turn to God, turn to Him and come to Him and say, I'm a sinner, please save me, the free gift is there. I don't have to try and figure out if you're one of God's chosen elect. I don't have to try and figure out, well, maybe you're non-elect, and maybe, you know, if, if you're non-elect, then you can't be an elect. And if you Just shut up, all right? Just read the Bible. Quit trying to figure out God's mind. 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to show you a couple more passages here, and then we're going to be done for today. 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Wait a second here. This is one that people will use. They'll try to de debunk eternal security with this, and they'll say, well, you see... The Lord bought them, and then they became false prophets, so they denied the Lord, and so therefore they lost their salvation. No, that's not what it's saying. That's saying the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, is there to save anybody who will have all men to be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever believeth in Him shall be saved. You know, over and over and over again. That blood is shed for all men. It's available to anybody. So the purchase price has been paid. It's right there. And the false teachers and false prophets come along and they say, I don't want it. Don't you talk to me about that stuff. I don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. False religionists, they understand. You know, they understand you get a, a hardcore Roman Catholic, excuse me, priest. He understands he's going to have to come out of that system. Salvation is going to mean the loss of his job. A lot of hirelings believe that way. They understand it. They understand if I really get saved, if I really get saved and I really start to stand for this King James Bible, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my career. So what do they do? They deny the Lord that bought them. So they go to hell. How does that work with Calvinism? If you are predestinated, pre-chosen before the foundation of the world, Okay, then you're one of the elect and, and things like this. And so the only, you know, the limited atonement, the L and the TULIP acronym there. How then does that work? You see the problems that this whole Calvinistic system creates? False teachers, false prophets deny the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Why would God say that he bought people that are non-elect and can't get saved? Kind of overthrows the whole system of Calvinism, doesn't it? Just a little bit. First Timothy one fifteen. First Timothy chapter one verse fifteen. It says here, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Uh, are we all sinners? Well, according to the Bible there, Adam is our father, so yes, we are born into sin. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Oh no, Jesus Christ came to save the elect that were chosen of God before the foundation of the world. Nonsense. Absolute, total nonsense. That's not at all what's going on there. Alright, and you see it again there. Worthy of all acceptation. Anybody can accept the fact that they're a sinner if they're willing to turn from their self-righteousness. If they're willing to turn from saying, I'm a good person. <laughs> Who are you talking about? I'm not a sinner. I'm not a bad person. The Bible says you are. <laughs> I reject that book. You know, that's the way most people feel. Finally, let's end up here in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Verses 11 through 15. 
It says here, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Sorry, John Calvin. Your system doesn't work. Verse 12, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You see, you get saved there. The grace, you know, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. Verse 11, that's where you get saved. Verse 12, teaching us, saved people, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's for us saved people. What are we looking for? Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. That's going to be our study on Calvinism. And you say, Brian, there's a lot of questions I still have. I still have a lot of questions, Brian. You didn't cover those questions. Well, if you truly are looking for truth, then you'll do some study on your own. Okay? You got it? And there's a lot of other resources out there, too. You can get online. You can find this stuff. I mean, you can call around and get different catalogs and whatever. I mean, there's all kinds of materials out there debunking Calvinism. But brethren, just a simple understanding of Scripture, you can see Calvinism doesn't work out. You don't have to be a real great scholar or anything else to, to you know, debunk uh, Calvinism. It's nonsense. And again, you know, I saw this one hyper-Calvinist one time, and he was like, you know, they were interviewing him, and he said, they said to him, uh, do you believe in soul winning? And he said, no, I don't. And they said, why not? And he said, well, because you're sinning if you witness to a non-elect individual. Okay. How do you know if somebody's non-elect? We don't. So you just don't witness to anybody. Because after all, unconditional election, somebody who saves one of the elect of God, they're going to get forced into salvation, so there's really nothing you can do about it either way. God saved them before the foundation of the world, so therefore they're going to get forced into salvation, so why bother witnessing? See how pleasant that system works out? You see how satanic that system is? That's the whole point. Because it gets you to a point where you're so proud, you're so prideful, you say, I'm a chosen elect of God. He chose me before the, the foundation of the world. I was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Therefore, I am holy and wonderful and beautiful and everything else. And I don't need to witness to people because after all, if you're one of the elect, you're going to get in anyhow. So I'm just going to live my life and just kind of you know, float about three inches off the floor as I just kind of pass through and, and bless people with my presence or something. <laughs> Calvinism is a bunch of nutty nonsense. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for the lies of Calvinism. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for creating us for the purpose of bringing you pleasure. And I thank you, Lord, for what you did for us on the cross so that we might come to you in belief and uh, come to you as sinners and knowing that we need your Son uh, your death on the cross to pay for our sins. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for that great sacrifice and the fact that we can have assurance of salvation. We can know that we are going to heaven when we die and that we have an inheritance there. I thank you for that, Lord. And uh, Lord, if there's anyone out there that's been um, spoken to by Calvinists, Lord, I pray that this sermon would get to them and that they would see that Calvinism is a, is a satanic cult, Lord. And while there were some men that were in the Calvinistic system that were good men, Lord, it was because of their sin, not because of uh, being right with you and, and in line with Scripture. Uh, they were just, they might have been saved, but they were wrong in their stands. So, Lord, I just pray that the, the saints would flee this teaching of Calvinism and um, just run away from it, Lord. And if, there are anybody, if there's anyone out there that has fallen for Calvinism, Lord, I pray that you would lower their pride and help them to see that their system just doesn't line up with Scripture. And that they would not fall for the thing of, of hyper-Calvinism, Lord, and get so messed up that they don't even bother witnessing to people anymore. Uh, I just pray for that, Lord, that there is somebody, even if they're a Calvinist and they, they are too proud to drop the system, Lord, I just pray that they would not fall into hyper-Calvinism. And uh, so, Lord, I just 
Ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that's going to be that. that that's going to be it for this week's sermon. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes I think to myself, I'm going to get through the whole thing without messing up. And I never do. You know, <laughs> you know, I, I often, I've seen different channels on YouTube, you know, and they'll put out a bloopers video and stuff like this, you know, places where they mess up. And I, you know, I've often thought entered in my mind, I ought to do something like that. And it's like, why? I record all my bloopers. <laughs> you know, I mean, everything I do, I mess up on, you know, unless it's really bad. You know, I, I put it on here for you to watch. So you get to see me making a, you know, stumbling over my words and all kinds of good stuff like that. I don't want your faith to rest in, in men. I don't want to ever have a system of Denlingerites, you know. I mean, that'll be put on you because if you defend me, you'll be called a Denlingerite, of course. I've seen that in the comments, you know, it's kind of funny. But uh, you don't follow me. Don't ever follow me. That's a dumb thing to do, you know. <laughs> it's the book, brethren, the Bible, King James Bible. That's what's going on. I thank the Lord for those of you who have been blessed by this ministry. I thank the Lord for those of you that have written to me and said about how that God has used me to get to you and teach you about some different subjects. I, I praise the Lord for that. But uh, don't ever, you know, put me up on a pedestal. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm just an old sinner. That's all I am. I'm not some kind of special pre-chosen elect, you know, that was God created me to be saved and everything else. And I had no say in the matter. You know, I didn't have to come as a sinner to the Lord. Don't fall for that stuff, brethren. So that's going to be it. Um, just trying to think of I have a couple different studies coming up here. I don't uh, don't know if I've mentioned them before, but so I'm just going to not say a whole lot on that. Uh, just a bunch of different things going right now. So uh, trying to get to people's sermon requests. This Calvinism thing has been a request for years now. I just I haven't been able to get around to it, so I'm finally glad I have something done on Calvinism. Um, so, I uh, guess that's going to be it. Um, of course, as I always like to say at the end, thank you for all those who pray for the ministry. Thank you for the, all those who donate to the ministry. We, we certainly appreciate that. And, um, and I guess just we'll see you next week, I guess. I have a couple other videos I'm going to be working on here. But uh, right now, the big push right now is that uh, working on the ministry headquarters here and, and doing some work on the, over at the land the Lord gave us and, and then here at the ministry headquarters, trying to get heat in here for the winter and, and everything else. So um, that's the big work right now. So, uh, you know, once I'm, you know, have some things settled uh, and I'm going to be able to really dedicate myself to some um, some more studies on different issues. So um, I guess that's going to be it. Please keep us in your prayers. And above all, brethren, stay in the Word. Stay in the Word of God. I can't stress that enough. Um, it is so dangerous to put this book down, to just say, you know what, I don't need to read it today because I read it yesterday and I read a lot yesterday or whatever. This is to be desired more than your necessary food. All right. You would do well skipping every meal of the day if it meant taking the time to read the Word of God, you'd do well to do that rather than forsaking this book. Okay, Things are getting real strange in this world, and I don't know how much longer it's going to be before that blessed hope, before the Lord takes us out of here, before we have our reunion in heaven, our fellowship, our true fellowship. I don't know how long it's going to be. I hope it's not too much longer. Um, but stay in the Word. Can't say that enough. So that's it. Thank you very much for watching.